This is the new Porsche 911. Actually, wait a minute now, I forgot. It's not 1999, is it? It's 2019. So get this old thing out of the way. Go on, get out of the way. This is the new Porsche 911, the 992. It's pretty special. Let's start this review by talking about the design because this new 992 is wider and longer than the old car. It's slightly higher, but you can't really tell. It's got this new rear light design, which is really cool. Not so sure about this area down here. There's a big load of plastic and then the number plates lower down there. Speaking of the number plate, look at this one. A911 four wheel drive, how appropriate. I do like the fact that all models are now wide body, whether you have the two wheel drive or this four wheel drive four version, all models have 21 inch alloy wheels at the back and 20 inches at the front. Also, the front track is wide as well for more grip. Overall, it's a really good looking car. I especially like the front and this yellow paint scheme, which I think the flies love as well. It's a smart, smart looking car. Classic 911 design, but looking very modern at the same time. I also like this feature as well. The handles, the way they pop out when you open the car. It means that when you shut the door, they're nice and flush. Inside, oh yeah. I have to say, it looks absolutely blooming lovely. I like what they've done with the dash design. The way it's kind of angled this way is like on the original 911. So too with the arrangement of the instrument binnacle, the way it's curved like that, that's cool. You've got a central rev counter as well, which is nice. And it's an analog one, which is suitably old fashioned, yet the rest of it is very, very high tech. I love the way that they've minimized the amount of buttons on the center console, so it's all just a little bit cleaner, and you get leather on pretty much every surface. It's absolutely gorgeous. In fact, it's very hard to find cheap materials in this cabin. The only ones I can find are down here. The rest of it, though, is lovely. The steering wheel's lovely. The gear shifter pedals, they're lovely. The damped controls, they're lovely. It's all lovely, lovely, lovely. Apart from one thing I've noticed. So when driving around town, I could hear a creaking sound, and it's coming from this trim, listen just flexing. The rest of it though is super, super solid. That's the thing with Porsches, they can feel really solid, but sometimes aren't as sturdy as you think. You can alter the bits of trim on here, on here, on here, to make the car look as you want it to look. And that actually brings me on to the equipment list on this car, because the range actually starts for now with the Carrera S. As standard, you get an 11 inch touchscreen with satellite navigation, Apple CarPlay, a 150 watt eight speaker sound system, and digital driving displays with a seven inch screen there and another one over the other side of the central rev counter. You also get leather heated front sport seats with electric backrest operation. The car also comes with a rear differential with torque vectoring so you can send power to the wheel with the most grip. You also get rear and front parking sensors, dual zone climate control and electronically controlled adjustable suspension. And then there are the options of which there are many, some of which are very, very costly, such as these carbon ceramic brakes, which do give you better braking performance on track, but they are £6,300. Then there's rear wheel steering, which aids high speed stability and low speed maneuverability for £1,600. Then on top of that, you can add active anti-roll bars for £2,300. Then there's the active sports exhaust, which you can make louder and quieter at the touch of a button for £1,800. You've got the all singing, all dancing LED dynamic headlights, which can blank out part of their beam so you don't dazzle other drivers. That'll cost you £2,000. If you're worried about scraping the front end of your lovely new 911 over speed humps, don't worry, you can get a lift kit for it, which raises it up so you don't bottom out. The only trouble is it'll cost you £1,700. And finally, there's a sports chrono pack, which is a must have at £1,600 because it gives you a bit more performance from the car's engine and gearbox. It includes a sports response mode, which when you press it, puts the car into its maximum attack settings for 20 seconds for instant overtaking. It also includes a little clock on the dash and active engine mounts. Now we need to talk about the infotainment system because it's a little bit of a mixed bag. So the screen is nice and bright. The graphics are good. It's responsive. It's dead easy to input a destination into the satellite navigation system. Also, it calculates routes quickly. It can divert your own traffic. You can easily input a waypoint as well. That is all very good. I also like the speed of the system. It's quick, look at that. No lag at all, like that a lot. But it's just so hard to operate when you're driving, partly because these icons are very small to hit and some of them are even smaller. And then there's the fact that certain things are actually only controlled through the infotainment system. For instance, if I want to change the sound of the exhaust, 
I have to press some buttons and then press that button there, which is annoying if I suddenly want to roll down the window because I'm coming to a tunnel and I want to experience a loud exhaust. A bit annoying as well that this caused the sports exhaust fitted with the two tailpipes, whereas the image shows the standard four tailpipes. Hmm, they could have sorted that out like they're doing BMWs. Another thing I don't like is that some of the settings and controls are hidden away like there for the different sources of your audio. So for Bluetooth, you have to do that. It's a bit of a faff. Thankfully, the climate control is separate. It's down here and you can control a few things using these dials, but not much just like volume and zoom in and out on the map. I think the infotainment system in a Mercedes S-Class Coupe is way better and easier to use. I do quite like the digital driver's displays and you can control each side if you want to. You just press a button to move across and then go through some different settings such as driving data, tyre pressures, you've got G-Force, you've got your sports chrono if you've got that fitted and satellite navigation. Then just toggle quite easily to the other side to control what's shown on the speedometer though there's not much functionality there to tell you the truth. One thing I can't complain about though is the driving position. It is brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. Doesn't matter if you're big or small, you're gonna be able to get comfy. In fact, look at this. I've got the seat low because I like to sit low, but there's loads of headroom. So tall people will be fine in this sports car. Look how the wheel is dead central to me. Porsche always nails that. They're pretty good in car storage as well, considering it's quite a small car. The door bins, there's two of them. You can fit a small bottle in this door bin there. There's room for a litre bottle because of the way that is recessed there. And then there's some room in front of that for some crisps. The cup holder is just the right size for the smaller cup of coffee so it doesn't knock the top off and you can have a bigger one there as well. It doesn't get too in the way either. But what about your passenger? Well, look, I like this feature. It pops out of the dash and they have their cup holder there. The glove box is also a decent size. In fact, it will fit the big bottle. And under here, you do have space for your mobile phone. The tray is big enough, even for the latest mobile phone, such as my Galaxy S10 Plus. Look, loads of room. You can probably get wireless charging as well as an upgrade. If you haven't got that though, look, you have two USB inputs there for charging your phone, which is great. Now let's talk about the other element of this car's practicality. So it's a sports car, but it still has some rear seats but by god it's small back here i'm just gonna move this seat out of the way so you can see what the heck's going on so look look at this that this seat is my normal driving position yeah in any kind of accident i am toast look at this because look at this my neck now kids can just about fit in here speaking of children let's talk about how easy it is to fit a child seat in this car the Isofix points are hidden behind a removable pad, which makes them really easy to see. Getting a rear-facing seat into position is a squeeze though, and once in, it's impossible to fold the front seats back into place. The toddler seat does fit safely, though you'll have to bend your back rather uncomfortably to clear the car's low roof. On the plus side, the 911's front passenger seat does have Isofix mounting points, so you can fit a rear-facing seat there, no problem at all. Now, one thing I've noticed while I've been sat, the squish back here, is a little coat hook on the seat back, just so you can hang your jacket there if no one is sat here, and no one's really gonna to want to. Not like they would do in the back of a Bentley Continental GT. It's better for rear passengers than this thing. Speaking of which, I'm gonna bail because I'm getting cramped. Oh, oh, this is not comfortable. Oh, it's like being born again. Oh, it's not good. Right, and now onto the boot. I'm not stupid, I got a 911. They're at the front. So you have to pop it using that switch there. And then you're greeted by a capacity of 132 litres, which is just about enough for me to sit in. Like that, really? Yeah. Actually, if you want to see how much you can fit in this car, well, it's not actually as bad as you may think. The space for one large suitcase, or you can fit a small suitcase, a small box, and a soft bag. Golf clubs won't fit, neither will a baby buggy. However, the 911's rear seat backs do fold down and then you can fit a buggy on top of them or a set or two of golf clubs. There's even room for a suitcase and a small box. You can fit a bike on them as well, but it's a real squeeze and you are at risk of damaging your car's leather interiors. Certainly better than some two-seater sports cars. Now then, it's time for the car wow five annoying things about this car. These digital dials may look cool, but the steering wheel actually obscures the outer two, so you end up having to look round to see the clock or round the other way to see the fuel gauge and it's especially annoying when you've got the satellite navigation screen up there because then it blocks the actual central arrow. Ah! All normal Porsche 911s are now fitted with turbocharged engines and quite frankly 
they don't sound as good. So this is what the new car sounds like. And this is what an old, naturally aspirated flat six sounds like. <laughs> what a world of difference. The stereo controls on the steering wheel may have a skip track forward button, but there's no skip track backwards button. So you can't re-listen to a track you've just heard that you really like. Oh, actually you can, you have to just use the dial down here, which is a little bit annoying. Why don't they just fit the button here? And like most new cars, the new 911 is actually heavier than the version it replaces. At 1,565 kilos, it actually weighs 55 kilograms more than the old car. Now you can put that down to the fact that the body is bigger, it's got bigger wheels, there's more crash protection, there's more emissions regulation stuff in there, and a new eight-speed automatic gearbox adds an extra 20 kilograms alone. The surround view cameras cost an extra 1,200 pounds. And annoyingly, the reversing camera is such a wide angle that you can't really judge where the edges of the car are, so it's almost useless. It's not all negative though. Here's five good things about this car. There are acoustic sensors in the wheel arches which lessen out for rain. And if it is raining, it automatically puts the car into wet mode with reduced throttle response and gearbox settings so that you don't suddenly spin off the road. The rear wing is 25% bigger than before for more downforce and it automatically rises at 55 miles an hour to 10 centimetres high. But then when you go above 93 miles an hour, it rises an extra five centimetres for even more stability. The intercoolers for the turbocharged engine sit on top of it for more power. Also, the turbos actually spin in opposite directions so they spool up quicker. These vents for the radiators can actually rotate shut when the engine doesn't need cooling to aid aerodynamics. This new 911 992 can lap the Nürburgring in just seven minutes and 25 seconds, which is five seconds quicker than the old 991. What the heck was that for? You said if you ever mentioned Nürburgring lap times, it's hit you in arse. Actually, he's right. It dates back to an old Nissan GTR video I did. The Nürburgring. Ah, uh, uh, really hurts actually. At the moment, you can only get the Porsche 911 with a three litre flat six turbocharged engine with 450 horsepower. There's a rear wheel drive version, the Carrera 2S, or the four wheel drive version, which is the Carrera 4S. Both come as standard with an eight speed dual clutch automatic gearbox. A manual version will be offered at a later date, as will a lower powered Carrera version. There'll also be the more powerful turbo versions and the sportier GT2 and GT3 models as well. Right, let's see how quick this thing can get from naught to 60 miles an hour. So I've got my specialist timing gear up here to measure the time. It'll basically launch in all modes besides wet, but I've got it in Sport Plus. Gearbox in drive, left foot on the brake, right foot on the throttle, release the brake. It's so simple, you can just do it dead easily in this car over and over and over again. Right, let's do it. Oh my goodness. Done. <laughs> what time did it do? <laughs> that is utterly insane. Nought to 60, three seconds dead. <laughs> and look at this. Off we go again. That easy, and it's over again. Not to 60 yet again. Three seconds dead. The way this thing gets off the line is insane. I mean, with the engine at the back, you've got awesome traction. Four wheel drive as well. Brilliant gearbox and launch control system. It is immense. It's quicker than 450 horsepower. Other cars with 450 horsepower won't be this quick at launching. Classic Porsche. 911s are designed to be daily driven. It's perfectly fine in town. You do notice the firm suspension, especially over speed humps, and when you hit a pole, you get a jolt, but it's not terrible. The steering's pretty heavy, but I forgive it that, because it's a sports car, and the turning circle's actually quite good for a car of this kind. Another thing I like about it is that you get a decent view out, and the brakes, they're not grabby. They're so strong, yet very easy to use, even these carbon ceramics. So parking it, what's that like then? Well, I've got quite a tight space here, and I'm going to try and get into it. I will be using the parking sensors quite a lot, as I have no idea what's going on at the back end. However, visibility isn't totally terrible. I think I've made a right pig's ear of this. I'm going to have to go again. Embarrassing. Let's have a go, because I'm busy talking to you guys rather than concentrating. Right. 
Someone did say to me, Matt, do you want me to make the space a bit bigger? Because it's going to be hard. Oh, frick. I ballsed it up again. We'll get there in the end. It's quite a wide car, so you can end up sticking out quite a bit. That's my excuse. That is one thing about it. It is very, very wide, so you kind of struggle sometimes to get it into a parking space. But hey, who cares? It's a 911. Get out on the motorway and the 911 is fairly decent. The suspension still is on the firm side, but it always feels secure and it just grips the road really well when you're going quickly. What is annoying is the amount of road noise you get from those big tires. It just gets on your nerves. A bit of wind whistle from up there as well. And I think a BMW 8 Series is more relaxing to travel long distances in. What I can't fault though is the response from this engine and gearbox. So, so I'm boodling along at 50 miles an hour. I need to overtake. Floor it. What? <laughs> That was it, I was 70 like that. The gearbox just kicks down instantly and the engine just flies. And actually, inside, the car makes a good noise. That's because it's piping fake sounds through the speakers. I don't like that about a Porsche. They shouldn't do that. As for the economy, well, I'm getting 24 miles per gallon, which isn't great. Although maybe when you consider the amount of performance it has, it's forgivable. If you're lucky enough to own a 911, you are going to go hunting for twisty roads because this is where this car just excels. Oh my God, the way it just grips. It grips so well. And you can tell what it's doing beneath you. It really is pretty good. It doesn't communicate with you quite as well as my old 996. It's not as raw as that car, but the speeds you can carry. <laughs> and the confidence it gives you is way, way more. Also, like my car, it's got stability control, which will actually help you out if things start to go wrong. But it doesn't interfere too much. It just works away in the background, secretly saving your skin. Oh my God, this thing is just awesome. <laughs> I don't know whether you need the four-wheel drive version though. I probably just want the Carrera too, but on a slippery day, this will help you out, the four-wheel drive. So then, What's my final verdict on the Porsche 911? Should you have, actually just forget all that kind of suspense. Just go right ahead and buy this car. It is the best all round sports car. Yeah, it's not perfect, but really, if I had the money, I would buy one of these.